Hello, hackers. Welcome to Hacker 101 iOS Web Views. In this module, you'll learn about the different types of web views used in iOS applications and the weaknesses that arise when they are used incorrectly. We'll also look at how to identify web views in an application and exploit simple cross-site scripting vulnerabilities. The demos and exercises in this module will require an iOS device to follow along. I'll be using a jailbroken device in the video, but you can also use a jailed device if you follow the instructions we've provided. In mobile applications, a web view is an embedded browser used by the application for a number of purposes. The most common are to allow the user to browse to a website without leaving the application, or to display static content from either the web or a local file, for instance, showing a privacy policy that is loaded from a website. You'll also encounter applications using web views to present a consistent interface on both Android and iOS, and to provide a way for users to leverage single sign-on credentials from the browser. The oldest WebView class that you'll still encounter in the wild is UI WebView. Apple deprecated UI WebView in iOS 8 in favor of more secure alternatives, so it isn't as common, especially in newer apps. In 2020, Apple stopped allowing UI WebView in new App Store submissions, but it still allows it in updates to existing apps. UI WebView is an attractive target for exploitation due to a number of weaknesses in its security profile. By default, the configuration of a UI WebView can't be modified to disable JavaScript execution or, to, or access to local files. File origins are particularly dangerous because there is no same origin policy applied to those URLs. UI WebView also runs in the application's process, which means that something like a memory corruption exploit would directly affect the application. In fact, under the right conditions, UI WebViews can be vulnerable to universal cross-site scripting. Depending on the context, this can have severe consequences. The vulnerability occurs when the application loads content using a method that has a base URL parameter. If the base URL is set to null, the same origin policy is disabled for the loaded page. As a result, the contents of the web view can access any origin. Consider, for instance, the content reading a file from the app's file system and sending it to an attacker-controlled endpoint. Starting in iOS 8, Apple introduced WK WebView to replace UI WebView. WK WebView has significant security improvements, including more granular control over the configuration, a more restricted default posture, and adherence to the same origin policy. WK WebView also runs out of process to further protect the application. Both UI WebView and WK WebView were intended for use when the application needs full control over the presentation of the WebView and visibility into the requests and responses. However, there are times when an application either doesn't need that level of control or doesn't want it. SF Safari View Controller was introduced in iOS 9 to meet that need. It provides an experience very close to using Safari on the device, but allows the user to browse without leaving the app. In iOS 9 and 10, SF Safari View Controller shared data with Safari, so apps often used it to facilitate logging in with credentials or cookies that Safari already knew. However, in iOS 11, this ability was restricted so an app's instance of SF Safari View Controller only had access to its own data. Instead, Apple introduced SF Authentication Session in iOS 11, and later AS Web Authentication Session in iOS 12 for authentication-specific functions. These session classes are intended for use with single sign-on mechanisms or third-party authentication like OAuth. The key differentiators between the different web views come down to what an app can and can't access. In WK WebView and its predecessor UI WebView, the app can see all traffic. This would not be a good choice for third-party authentication. For instance, if you are using your Google account to authenticate to an app, you only want the app to get a token to authenticate you to that app service, not your password to access your entire Google account. SF Safari View Controller technically would meet this need of sandboxing your request and response data from the app. But because it doesn't share data anymore with the main Safari app, you may end up logging in multiple times for the same service. SF Authentication Session offers a smoother experience in terms of sharing data, but Apple deprecated in iOS 12 in favor of AS Web Authentication Session. That class is going to be functionally similar with a key difference. It does not share session cookies with Safari. And further, the app can request the session not retain any data past the login operation itself. This can be helpful to ensure that logins don't per persist longer than needed. But even so, it is useful to examine how the app handles logging the user out. The interface provided for these authentication sessions can make that tricky. When examining an application's web views, it is useful to consider the following points. 
First, try to identify what type of web views are used, paying attention to whether the type used is appropriate for the context. Second, examine how the web view is configured. For instance, if JavaScript is enabled, does the application actually need it? Third, monitor the web view while using the app to see what URLs are loaded and what JavaScript is executed, if any. Finally, consider whether the web view communicates with native code. This may be done using JavaScript callbacks or using messaging facilities provided by the WebView class. Let's look at how to monitor some of this information in a running app using Frida. I've connected my jailbroken iPad to my computer over USB and launched the eBay application for this example. I'm using the dash M flag to tell Frida that I want to trace Objective C methods that match the specified pattern. First, I want to match both class and instance methods, so I use a wildcard as the first character. I'd like to match any class that ends in WebView, which should trace both UI WebView and WK WebView. Finally, I want to match any method that starts with load. I also specified a pattern to match SF Safari View Controller methods starting with init and any class ending in authentication session with a method starting with init. I've chosen all of these because they will allow us to see the URLs loaded in each WebView. Once Free to Trace has finished instrumenting the application, we can see that 22 functions were found that match the specified patterns. There are methods from UI WebView and WK WebView, and also an unfamiliar class that extends one of the matching classes. There are also matching methods from SF Safari View Controller and both authentication session classes. I'll start clicking around in the application. As I do that, Free to Trace will log some output anytime one of the traced functions is invoked. Now I know which types of web views are used in different areas of the application. However, I'd like to get more information about what is loaded in each web view. To do that, I'll edit each of the JavaScript handler files that Frida generated to instrument the application. This file is used to instrument WK web views load request method. I can wrap the arcs to that the trace outputs by default with Frida's objectobjc.object, which will create a JavaScript binding to this Objective-C object. I'll then call toString to get a human-readable representation of the object. If I rerun the trace again, the modified handler will be loaded. I'll interact with the application again and now the trace contains URL information for the WK WebView load request method. Other methods still show only pointers, so I would need to edit each of those handlers to get more visibility into those requests. Once you've examined an app's web views, you will have a better idea of which may be vulnerable to cross-site scripting. You'll want to look for a web view that has JavaScript enabled and contains a way to plausibly inject a malicious script from an outside source. Some common vectors include URL scheme handlers that use the input to load a web view, sharing HTML content to an app that opens it in a web view, user-generated content loaded into a web view from a server, or links clicked in the app or web view itself that load malicious content. We can use Frida to trace the interaction with a vulnerable web view while we send it malicious input. I once again have my jailbroken iPad connected to my computer via USB. I've launched the iGoat Swift application and started the cross-site scripting exercise. If I enter text into the form and click load, the text is reflected in the page. It also gives us a clue that the text is loaded in a UI web view. I'd like to know what method is used to load the text before trying to exploit this. I'm using free to trace to instrument all methods starting with load in the UI WebView class. I've already edited the auto-generated handlers, so I get more context about the method inputs. There are three matching functions. I'll try loading the text again, and my trace shows that the load HTML string base URL method is invoked. You'll recall from earlier in the module that this method can be vulnerable to universal cross-site scripting when the base URL is set to null, and that is the case here based on the output of free to trace Now I can try different inputs and see if any of it is filtered or sanitized before the string is passed to the web view.
I'm not going to give away the answer here, but this should give you enough information to start wor working on a good exploit for this exercise. You now have a good idea of the differences between the various web views, how they should and shouldn't be used, and what to look for when analyzing a web view security. If you haven't already, be sure to check out the first four modules in this series for more content on iOS application analysis. And as always, happy hacking!